Welcome to Bug Hunt Team Leader Training Part 1. And thank you so much for attending this training or retraining to become or become a better team leader and lead a team of volunteers for our bug hunts and our stonefly search monitoring days. We, we rely on people like you that are willing to give of your time and to develop your knowledge and skills to lead a team. Um, I mean, you really make this program possible. And this program you may or may not be aware of is actually part of what's called the Michigan Clean Water Corps or My Corps for short. Um, and My Corps was created by the governor of Michigan in 2003, which if you're as old as me, um, you might remember it was Jennifer Granholm. Um, and that was back when it was the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality. Anyway, um, she created this organization um, to assist the state in collecting and sharing water quality data for use in water resources management and um, protection programs. And their mission is to network and expand volunteer water quality monitoring organizations statewide for the purpose of collecting, sharing, and using reliable data educating and informing the public about water quality issues and fostering water resource stewardship to facilitate the preservation and protection of Michigan water resources. So that organization offers training for stream and for lake monitoring groups. So we're part of the stream monitoring program. But if you live on a lake, uh, there's a wonderful program where you can sign up to do uh, different types of monitoring in lakes, and including things like SecuDIS to test for clarity, some things about chlorophyll, aquatic plants, other things like that. Um, they also disseminate methods for accurate data collection, which is one of the things they do for us. They implement effective quality assurance practices, and they facilitate data reporting and information sharing online. So we actually uh, uh, submit our data to them, and then they provide a forum for communication and support among volunteer water monitoring um, groups in Michigan. So, yeah. so just to sum it up, um, they oversee the stream monitoring program, a lakes program. They also actually have a grant program for people doing um, volunteer stream cleanups. Um, but a lot of what they do is make sure that all of us are collecting data um, with high quality standards so that this data is something that is useful to governmental agencies like the state of Michigan. So that's, that's part of why we wanna make sure that all of you are trained properly and collecting using consistent measures. Um, so moving on, just a you know brief history of our program. We started it in 1998 with a um, volunteer monitoring program grant from what was then the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality, which is really a predecessor to what's now the uh, in uh, Michigan Environment, Great Lakes, and Energy. Um, so we offer training and, um, you know, just we do a training like this really in person, but um, then we'd hand some equipment to the trainees and say, please adopt a spot on the river and sample it twice a year and give us your data. And uh, in 2001, we decided to move to this group sampling event format just because we were concerned about um, people, you know, sending people alone to the river. We feel much more comfortable uh, with people sampling um, with more people out there with them, not being alone out there in the river. You really should never put on waders and go into the river by yourself. Um, we also decided a group sampling format would increase the number of volunteers participating um, because uh, if you could train team leaders, then you could allow untrained volunteers to come. And as, as all of you know, they can be extremely helpful picking bugs. Um, and they can assist the trained people, uh, the people that like you, we call team leaders. So in 2001, we started that and uh, we ever since then, We've been regularly holding a spring bug hunt. That was our very first event, a uh, fall bug hunt. And then we also do the winter stonefly search. I know that um, Pete had mentioned he had gone to the Clinton. So we do that too. 
Um, sometimes that's even more popular because there's not that many opportunities to get outdoors in Michigan and go crack through the ice and look for bugs when it's snowing. Um, so those are our three events and we're hoping as team leaders that you're able to volunteer for most, if not all of them. Um, and our funding, we've, we've, um, we've over the 24 years of this program, uh, we've uh, kept it going through various funding sources. Uh, currently, we receive the bulk of our funding through the Rouge communities, i.e. the cities, townships, villages, and one of the counties, Washtenaw County, that we sample in. They actually uh, sponsor sites in their community for the spring and the fall bug hunt. The Alliance of Rouge Community has been funding our annual stormfly search. Uh, that's an entity made up of the communities that work together on their stormwater permits. Um, we also receive additional uh, support through the state from a grant uh, from EGLE. And then we have applied for additional funding from MICOR uh, as a maintenance grant. Um, so just a little bit of background on the Rouge River watershed. So it's a medium-sized watershed, drains 467 square miles of land. Uh, we've got, you know, the four major branches that have 127 river miles, the lower, the middle, the upper, and the main. Uh, and then when you include the tributaries, that's more like 570 miles of stream. So it's a lot of stream. Um, it spans 48 communities uh, in three counties. Uh, you've got a big portion of Oakland County, Wayne County, and then a smaller portion of Washtenaw County home to 1.35 million people. And then, you know, we've also got 400 lakes and impoundments, you know, part of the river that's blocked off with a dam that forms a, a, like a lake. Uh, 300 parks, 20,000 acres, and 27 nature preserves. So, um, you know, we have a lot of natural habitat, but when it comes down to it, the Ridge River watershed is one of the most urbanized watersheds in the country. Uh, which is the, the biggest thing that limits the number of macro invertebrates that we find. So this map that I'm showing you here is basically looking at different land uses. The redder, darker red you get, the more dense urban it is. So you can see the vast majority of the watershed is pretty dense urban. Um, with some of the remaining uh, forested natural habitat being at the outer western reaches, uh, a little bit in the northern stretch, and some little pockets of habitat that have been preserved. And this map right here shows you some of our scores uh, from our benthic macroinvertebrate monitoring. So the, the orange uh, circles are fair the red are poor, the green are good. And you can see a reflection of how developed the area is. For example, up here in Troy, we have one spot that's pretty good where it's green. Um, the lower, the headwaters of the lower and the middle branch where you have less developed land um, have some of our best diversity. This is where our Johnson Creek is, our cold water trout stream that, that um, Pete mentioned, we call it creek, not drain, because we like to call it a creek. Uh, and then even some pockets along the main that give us some hope. Uh, then I also wanted to show you this map right here. And this was shows some recent modeling done on the changing nature of roof streams. So the dark red areas show uh, areas that are urbanizing quickly, while the green areas are actually areas that are reforesting. So Michigan develops its land eight times faster than the population grows. It might be changing a little bit now, but unfortunately our healthiest areas are right now facing the most change. Um, you know, the, the threat today is less the industrial pollution and more unwise leaders allowing this uncontrolled growth. And, you know, we had two examples just today. There's a group up in West Bloomfield that contacted us because there was, I think, about 18 acres of old growth forest that was slated to be developed. And there's a group that came together to try to protest that. And unfortunately, they sent us the email this morning that the bulldozers had come. 
We had one more positive story of uh, um, some development going on in Canton that um, they wanted to change the zoning to take down some woods and that was opposed by the group of people who came and that got voted down. But, um, you know, it's pretty tough. I mean, for the most part with the Rouge, um, you know, its biggest, oldest problems are down in the main stem where you've got all that industrial pollution and then you have a lot of, you know, urban infrastructure, combined sewers um, that still overflow raw sewage into the river when it rains that we still haven't addressed. But honestly, you know, 75, 80% of the pollution coming to the river is coming from stormwater which is why we have a huge focus on trying to increase habitat, put more green infrastructure, rain gardens, things where we can get more of the water to infiltrate um, and less of the water to run off straight into the river. So those are kind of our major problems. Um, on a, a little more positive note here, we've been doing quite a few fish surveys and um, fish do seem to be coming back in the rouge. Um, we've spent billions of dollars on cleaning up the rouge and it really is showing an impact. So um, we've got uh, some endangered species. Uh, in general, the fish are pretty healthy uh, above this glacial moraine. We've got some other pockets of some interesting diversity. Um, in this area where we still have uncontrolled CSOs, um, that's still actually even more degraded than say that cement channel with um, the, uh, the concrete channel in the more industrialized area. And there are a lot of projects right now coming online to deal with contaminated sediments down around Zug Island and upstream and to do some things to deal with the uh, like five to six miles we have of concrete channel that's kind of a wasteland for the fish. And the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is currently working on plans to install some oxbows and other things to really improve that habitat. So, so I am going to uh, turn this over to Sue, who's going to get us back to what we came here tonight to talk about, the bugs. Okay, thanks, Sally. Um, in the next sections that we're going to be um, uh, covering in the, the training tonight is to um, uh, get you um, get you up to speed in terms of when you're taking your team out into the field, uh, what you're going to be doing at the site uh, in terms of collecting and also um, handling the data sheets and um, ensuring that we're getting um, accurate accurate and reflective uh, reporting of our of our event and uh, introducing you a little bit to the um, the, the water uh, Water critters that we're out, that we're going to be out spending our um, our week our weekday or weekend looking for. So, um, as it says, aquatic insects are diverse and interesting. So that's probably what lead, are, is leading those of you to um, to come and, and be team leaders and, and learn a lot more about our um, aquatic uh, aquatic uh, fronts. So why why are we even uh, collecting um, bugs or macros or benthics or insects or BMIs, uh, whatever name that you like to use for uh, the benthic macro invertebrates that live in um, at or near the uh, bottoms of our streams and rivers? Um, well, why we do that is uh, we're here to to learn about uh, the river, um, so that's good science. Uh, it's a way to get in there. We can. Um, repeat the methods, um, there's established methods to use, and um, we can re um, re replicate that to get good data. Um, but what the bugs tell us, even though they can't, can't talk to us um, in our language, but they're indicators of the, the uh, stream conditions, uh, what's going on. Uh, the, the bugs, uh, not like fish, fish, if there is an acute um, pollution source going on that, that impacts uh, the stream they can they can they can um, they can swim and, and uh, move away. Um, unfortunately, the the insects live their their life cycles and start off. Um, uh, a lot of them spend their entire lives in the stream, and some of them do hatch out into um, of, of other forms of insects, typically flying. Um, but they they won't be there. The presence or absence is what's important to us as um, as scientists uh, studying the river. So the goal here for us is uh, the di diversity and the, the number of things that we're finding in the site um, indicates that we have a healthy stream. If if we're finding a, a lot of different uh, types of things, 
um, that's that's good as opposed to for only finding a lot of one or two different types of organisms and then then we'd be concerned of, of, of what's going on. Um, and um, also fit as um, as pointed out in one of the introductions, it's um, is the aquatic insects also serve um, the part of the food chain. So they're serving as um, as a food source for other other um, other critters that live in the stream, like like the fish. And if there's that that tie to to the the quality of the food and the quantity of the food that's in the um, in the stream, you know, for our for our, the other um, for the other life. Um, the, the threats to the, the bug diversity, as uh, Sally mentioned in some of the earlier, earlier slides, it's um, um, the overall development of, of the, the Rouge River watershed, um, which he showed you on the slides there, is just um, a big concern with how that impacts um, the, uh, the stormwater runoff quantity and also quantity uh, does impact um, um, the, the health of the stream and in, in the uh, um, creatures that live in it. Um, but those threats there is part of that development is the sediment, the sedimentation just from the increased flows, picking up all the um, all the stormwater that is coming off of impervious surfaces. And the habitat loss is just seeing that as the development's going out um, and there's just less and less habitat for um, uh, for for the natural from the natural um, natural world to live in and that's also affects you know the riparian corridors as well um and also pollution the, the pollution that's tied with just the um, increased human use of the uh, of the watershed there's more uh, propensity to for spills uh, just the uh, um, pollution just due to to run off and we'll be getting into uh, some indicators of um of uh, pollution sources uh, later on in the presentation also uh uh, the bug hunt for those of you who haven't volunteered on one or haven't been part of one, they're they're a lot of fun. It's it's a, it's a great way to get out, get outside and meet um, like-minded um, volunteers, and um, get out and, and enjoy a day in the river and learn about and learn about um, learn about the bugs. Um, also, what makes it um, good for volunteers to participate in is that the sampling of techniques are are fairly. Um, fairly easy to, to replicate and to, to perform once you get the, the riffle dance down and uh, uh, knowing what habitats to sample in. So it is something that uh, volunteers readily um, are um, eager to do and, and can replicate um, to the level of uh, you know, professional um, uh, uh, people doing the, uh, the sampling with proper training. Um, also, the things people are concerned is like when we're out collecting um, at the sites, it's like, well, are we getting all the bugs that are there? You know, is that a concern with the populations? Um, when we're out sampling, it's typically we're, we're catching a snapshot of the stream in that particular day. Uh, it's, we're just getting, it's like after rainstorm, it's just, just that um, we're only getting a small portion of the, the entire um, insect population at, at the site. Um, so next next slide, please, Sally. Um, so when you actually head out into the field um, to do some sampling, as Sally's mentioned, uh, we, we used to meet um, together in, in, um, in, uh, at the Friends of the Rouge office uh, or another location to uh, get meet your team and, and head out in the field, but uh, COVID uh, changed that practice. And so we are meeting the, uh, directly out into um, the field um, to meet the team. Uh, you're typically showing up in the team anywhere from four to six folks, um, just enough to to, um, to to have enough folks to be able to help uh, somebody to help run trays, um, help set the help help set the uh, site up, and then um, then everyone that's there is 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 picking through the trays. You have the very important task of of, of going through the trays that the collector um, of the material that the collector is collecting in the, the stream and sorting through that, looking for those moving things. Um, so that's very key um, in, in getting a good, uh, a good collection started. Um, so you're gonna be having, um, you know, your, all your, um, your, your forceps, your, your spoons and all the things that you can use to help go through the, uh, the white trays, the trays of the uh, samples that the, uh, that the collector is, is collecting. So optimally we, we would have the team of, of five going out at least if, if um, if we get enough volunteers to cover. And so that would be the collector that's the person, the only person on the team that is going to be going in the stream to, to collect 
um, the the uh, from the stream itself. So then you'll have a bank leader, the person that is going to be helping coordinate um, with the, with the collector, but setting up on the bank and helping coordinate the team, getting them um, into their task, and getting the site set up. So um, so when the site sampled, you can start going through the the samples, and then if there's somebody there that can help um, um, to to help get the pickers coordinated and also also run trays um that's good and um get the pe people that are picking the trays get them uh, get them started um next slide please the the collector um is the person that's going to be getting in the water in the waders uh with um with the with the sample net and is going to be be sampling the the, the various habitats at the site uh, for uh, for uh, bugs, and so typically we're getting in the site as as a collector. Uh, safety safety is first. You want to make sure when you're getting in the site that um, um, you kind of assess what it looks like so that you can get safely in and out. Um, and if there is areas of deep water, is, is to use caution. Don't be um, uh, don't be going into situations where um, it's above above your waist or any or, you know it's supposed to be weightable and, and very safe. So want to keep it that way and also if you're getting into water that's too deep you know back out um but, but hopefully stay your site should be at, at levels that um are going to be considered weightable um streams so when you're in uh, the collectors in the water sampling the different habitats is the goal here is to um to sample thoroughly at the site for 30 to 45 minutes depending on the size of the site um, and the goal is, is to sample approximately 300 feet of that stream stream reach while you're at your site. Um, so you're looking to try to um, focus on the, the different habitats and collect multiple sections through there. So you're trying to trying to get a represent representative um, section of all the, the different habitats in the stream. Um, so what you're looking for in the different types of habitats as a collector, and, and those of you who, ha who haven't sampled before, um, when we do the sampling in the field, uh, you'll see this will be much more clear to you in terms of looking for the different habitats in the stream and how, how this actually works. But there's all the, the habitats listed there, and they, they may not all be at the, the site, depending on what site you're at, but, you know, the riffles, pools, you know, leaf packs, um, you're looking for the different habitats um, that aquatic insects can be been, can be clinging to or living in um, throughout the site. Um, next slide, please. Um, this is just an example of, uh, of, of the stream, stream complex, what, what a stream, um, an unmodified stream would look like. And so these are some of the different habitats that, that the collector would be, would be sampling in um, at the site. Um, so we'd be working um, downstream to upstream, and that's to just help the current will help keep pushing any sediment that you're disturbing when you're kicking up the bottom of the stream, stream aggressively with your net. Um, so that will flush downstream from you. But, but we're looking for um, things like riffles. That's the fast, a fast moving part of the stream that where the uh, water is very shallow and it's going over rocks. So that's very well or oxygenated part of the part of the stream. And then you have the run, it's a little bit more of a, of a straight, straight section of the stream. And then where there's a curve, um, we're going to be hitting a, a pool or somewhat of a deeper part of the stream where the what where the water is water is deeper than it is average in the run or the riffle. Um, so and then and then in the stream there is multiple sections of this. So if you have more than one riffle or more than one pool or run, then in your 300 foot stretch, you're going to be trying to capture and sample some of those different areas in each part to. Um, so we get a represents, representative sample throughout. Um, next slide, please. Okay, the collector here. This uh, collector is uh, ready and raring to go. Here is um, as as you as a collector, um, it's 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 key because um, you're 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 um, tasked with sampling um, sampling thoroughly and trying to sample the habitats um, as as. Um, thoroughly as possible too. Um, so basically you're getting it, you're the one in the waders uh, kicking around in the bottom of the stream, disturbing the rocks and the sediment on the bottom of the stream or the undercut bank um, and the woody debris, all that with your net and with your feet, um, performing the riffle dance to, to kick to kick the sediment and um, the macroinvertebrates up into your net. 
Um, and then also once your net is filled, then it's you're filling um, you're filling the tray, and then that's going back to the the pickers to um, to take a peek through the the sample trays. Um, as a collector, you're not going to be going through the net yourself. Um, that's going to be be up to your team um, uh, to go through the debris and um, the material that you've collected um, during your efforts. Um, one thing to keep in mind is the the nets that uh, Friends of the Rouge are using. Uh, uh, they do have a fine a somewhat of a fine mesh. And um, I do advise uh, the collectors to make sure you do rinse your samples very thoroughly before you put them in the trays. Um, if you hand, um, if you hand a, a tray full of muck or really mucky water up to your sample, your team, they're going to be like, hey, we're not going to be able to see anything in here. So um, do your best to rinse those samples um, so that the water is relatively clear so that as as your team is sorting and as the uh, micro um, macroinvertebrates start moving around, that they'll be able to see them. Otherwise, it'll just be a junky, junky muck, and they'll be like not very happy with you. Um, next slide, please. For the pickers, when you're you're uh, also very a uh, key portion of the team, and so you're you're going to be tasked with being on the bank and, and just like these people in the picture here, you're going to be going through um, the samples that are collected um, from the stream and trying to capture the 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 bugs that are that are present in the um, the stream. So. Um, the goal of the picking for the team is you don't we're picking for about for about an hour and we're also the goal is now is, is to be collecting pretty much keeping everything that's found. Um, we're putting those uh, the critters that are collected we're putting those in, in ice cube trays um, and then that way we are kind of glancing just to see kind of um, you don't have to count everything exactly but that way to kind of give an estimate on well if we're close to getting over um, a, a amount of creatures. And what we're looking for is at least, we want at least 60, if that's possible at your site. It may or may not, depending on, on what site you're sampling. Um, but then preferably if we can get over get over um, 100, you know, if you're at a site that has um, some decent diversity. Um, so it's just trying to get a general snapshot to make sure we're hitting those, those metrics. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, when you're when you're finding the the uh, insects or, or things moving around, is to pop those in the ice ice, ice cube trays, and then when the um, the uh, when the when the when the picking time is done and pretty much uh, gone through the trays, is that um, the team leader at that point, whether the collector or the bank leader, will um, will take and and will put will put the um, will put the um, insects collected into into the um, a jar of ethanol and unfortunately for those of you that are um that's a bummer it's it's one this is one of the toughest jobs about doing on uh, the team leading is actually having to to um to um to kill some of the specimens because we take those and then they are also identified later so um it is a critical part of of our um of our identification and part of the uh, the quality control for our for our sampling procedure so um but just i tell myself it's just they are giving their lives for for science so that we can um better understand the rules so it's that's the tough part so um but the things that we don't keep uh, that don't come back to uh, the friends of the rouge lab is um the cl the, any clams the full-size clams their mussels um they go back into into the stream as well as snails uh fish and crayfish and those those are also going to be things that are going to be counted as part of uh, when we're doing the um, um, scoring of the site, and that's something that Sally will go into. Um, one exception here would be invasive species, is that we're advised um, not to put those back into into the river, like the snails or, or I mean, the clam, you know, zebra mussels, or um, even some of the mouth gobies. Okay, next slide, please. Um, normally, um, with our past protocol, that we would uh, go through um, benthic macroinvertebrate identification uh, with team leaders, but due to the change in the, um, the, the the protocols, that's something that we encourage you to um, to do on your own to to learn more about um, all the fascinating uh, creatures that uh, that we have and the diversity that we have, because um, it's a lot of fun. Uh, very interesting and fascinating, um, but we encourage you to um, 
to check out some of the uh, the presentations here that are listed in the um, on the presentation. And then also for those of you who are interested in um, in learning more, or practicing bug ideas. Um, at a future date, um, Friends of the Rouge will, will um, give an opportunity to um, to come to the lab and actually take a look at your some of the samples so that you can get a chance to see what they look like and uh, um, practice um, practice your identification. So kind of moving on to uh, those of you who are familiar with the old system, we used to use this system where we'd come up with a stream quality score based on dividing every organism into sensitive, somewhat sensitive, or tolerant, and then giving it a higher score if it was sensitive, um, and if there were more of them, you know, roughly rare would get um, a five, common would get a 5.3. Um, my core decided that um, these categories were just not um, that effective. And some of the things like snails, like gilled snails that were up in the sensitive category were actually much less sensitive than the somewhat sensitive ones. And so they decided to redo it. So we are no longer using the system although we still will continue to calculate these scores just because there's no, we want to be able to compare to our past data. Um, and when you look at all of these things, you know, we want to, we want, you know, the bugs tell us a lot about the health of the site. And we like to translate that to a number. And, um, you know, they, we biologists studies these organisms and their sensitivity to things like pollution um, that comes into the stream through, you know, point like directly from a pipe or just running off the land, non-point, um, you know, from natural sources, like maybe sediment running off of a site, uh, agriculture or urban sources, which is a lot of it for us. Um, also, you know, organic pollution caused by wastewater, fertilizer, uh, nutrients like phosphorus and nitrogen, pesticides, and all of these are strongly connected to oxygen levels because when you look at the benthic macroinvertebrates, the ones that are the most sensitive, like your stoneflies, your mayflies, your caddisflies, they get their oxygen from the water with gills. And so they need really high levels of dissolved oxygen. And this organic pollution is going to rob the water of oxygen, whether that's, you know, fertilizers, wastewater, um, and even warming the water. Um, and this is also secondarily connected to the habitat quality and flow. And these are the things that your team may notice. You know, you, you may not know what the organic pollution sources are, but when you look at a site and you see degraded habitat, you, you know, the, the habitat is degraded, um, you can see the bank erosion, you can see sediment in the water, you can notice flashy water flows when the river goes way high and way low, so you can see where how high it went last time and how much erosion there is. Uh, you can see that, you know, though Sue showed that idealized a uh, river segment with the riffles and the, and the nice bends and pools. Um, a lot of our river is just straight because it's been channelized. Um, we've lost a lot of our riparian cover, the overhanging vegetation, the forests. Uh, we've lost a lot of our woody debris. You know, people complain about log jams and gigantic log jams um, aren't the greatest habitat, but we do need some of that wood in the stream. Um, less habitat. So we're trying to look at the biology that translate into kind of measuring that organic pollution. So just going back to this old system, um, there just were a lot of problems with the categories being so specific when it's a little bit more um, continuous variable. Um, and then there also were some addition, uh, issues with uh, misidentifications. So we have a new system um, that's based on the Hilsenhoff index, which is kind of an old system of, of rating macro invertebrates by their sensitivity. Um, and 
but we also are changing the way that we're asking you to do this. So we're not actually asking you to identify in the field. Um, we are asking you, number one, to get that 100 organisms, whether they be mayflies, midge larva, whatever. So it's really important as a collector that you go there and make sure you sample all of those habitats and that your pickers find you know, 100 organisms if they can, um, because basically the new scoring system, if you find less than 60 organisms, that that's just gonna give you a score. If you find less than 30, it's gonna give you a really poor score. But if you can shoot for that 60 to 100, then, um, you know, we can, can score it at a higher level. So um, in the transition into this new system, like I said, we're no longer asking you to identify in the field. You can do a little bit of that, but we are asking you, since we told you there's certain things that you do not collect, that you do not put into the jar. So those are things like the crayfish. You note those, but we do need you to count those. So whether you find them in the tray and put them in a bucket, or your collector out there sees them and keeps a count. Um, but you want to keep a count of them, but we don't ever preserve them. Same goes with the freshwater mussels, which are the really large size clams. Uh, fingernail clams and Asian clams are actually non-native, but they go into the score. I'm sorry, fingernail clams are native. They're the, the real small clams. So I'm going to show you a picture in a minute. The Asian clams and the zebra mussels are both of our non-native ones, but we still want you to count those. And then the snails, we always talk about right-handed, left-handed, coiled in one plane. And then some that you might not know of as a snail that are something you might think more of as a saltwater critter that's like shaped like a little hat. And I'll show you those in a minute. So these are the things that, I mean, you can put everything in the jar. If you can't identify that, that's fine. Um, the snails don't go in the jar, but you need to count and identify them. So if you have a snail, you want to look at it. You want to have the, the top pointing upward and the opening facing towards you. And if it's pointing off to the right and it has like an operculum, kind of a hard door there, uh, that would be a gilled snail. You only want to count any of these animals that are alive. So that door is there, so it's alive. You might have a left-handed snail that doesn't have that operculum, um, but make sure it's alive, not just a hollow shell. Uh, also, sometimes you get these coiled in one plane snails or plan orbidae, so we wanna count those. And then last but not least, this little hat you might see, and this you often find when you're kind of rinsing off the tray and they're stuck to the bottom like a leech, but they have little pointed hard cases. And those are limpets. So you also want to count those. Um, mussels and clams. So this can be a little bit confusing with the mussel clam thing. Um, one very common species we find is the fingernail clam. It's about maybe half an inch maximum, small oval to round brown shell, and they don't really have very strong ridges. So those are native, those are just clams. You just want to count them. We distinguish those from the native freshwater mussels. And all of these are at least two inches long. Their shape can vary. They can be round, they can be oval. And the freshwater mussels are some of the most sensitive critters that you find in the watershed, in part because they have this unique relationship with the fish and that they spew their kind of their gametes, but there's a portion of their life cycle that spends its time inside of a fish. And so if you don't have the fish there, they're unable to reproduce, unlike your fingernail clams that are, are fine without the fish. Most of our freshwater mussel, well, all of our freshwater mussels are legally protected. So technically, if you find them out of the site, um, you need to just return them back to the stream, but you know you can take a picture like you have here um, and place them back in the stream. And many of them are endangered or threatened. 
move on to the uh, invasive species. So uh, we actually do count all of the mussels and clams um, in our past form. We might have told you that if you found a, an invasive zebra mussel or an invasive clam, don't count it. We actually do count that as part of the score now, so you do need to count these things. So if you're not familiar with zebra mussels, they are these triangular shaped um, up to maybe one to two inches. Um, yeah, I see how I'm kind of cut off here on the bottom. I'm not sure why that is. Um, so in the rouge, anything with that triangular sort of classic muscle shape like that is going to be a zebra muscle. They actually tend to not show that zebra pattern. They tend to just be kind of blackish or brownish. Um, these things got here in the United States from Eurasia coming in um, in ships with their ballast water they bring in to stabilize and then they unfortunately release into the Great Lakes with that salt water and um, maybe not so much the mussels as the, the villagers, their um, reproductive, um, not so much eggs, but um, so they were able to spread. And they're a huge problem. They crowd out native mussels, they clog water intake pipes. Um, they've been known to strain out some of the phytoplankton that a lot of our fish rely on to eat. Um, and they also tend to harbor and concentrate things like E. coli and other toxins. So um, really not a very healthy thing for the watershed. Um, so you, you may see these at these sites. We actually rely on you as team leaders to track where these things are. Um, you know, we have them in the lower part of the Rouge. Um, we did find them in the middle branch and some parts of the upper branch. Not so much in the main branch, hoping that we don't find them there soon. So just keep an eye out for these and make sure you track them. The other uh, invasive clam that we have um, is the Asian clam. And these are a little bit bigger than the fingernail clams and they're very distinctive because they have really thick ridges. So um, I'm not sure that they came in through ballast water. They're not entirely sure, probably more brought in for food because they were introduced in the United States for food in the 80s. Uh, similar problems to the, the mussels. Um, and uh, we do have them in some portions of the Rouge and actually, unfortunately, even on the main. Um, so those are our clams. And then um, we also want you to keep track of the crayfish. For the most part, um, most of the crayfish that you will see in the river are our native ones. Um, they vary quite a bit in their color. Um, although none of them are bright red because we do have a, a recent one that's gotten in that's bright red. So no red spots on the, the side of it. Um, the rusty crayfish does have that or not bright red with bumps on it like the red swamp. So it's probably a native. So just count those guys, return them to the stream. They're, they're, they're fine there. Um, and then you oftentimes will see this type of fish that some people think it looks kind of like a bottom feeder they have in their aquarium. Um, they're kind of spotted, there's fairly small eyes. Um, and I'm just pointing this out because they're somewhat similar to an invasive fish that we have called the round goby. Um, and the round goby was something that was introduced in ballast water, um, got into the St. Clair River in the 1990s. Um, it's not form, it's from the black in Caspian Seas. Um, sorry about the misspelling here. And they do outcompete some of the native benthic fish. In fact, they've been wiping out some of our native Johnny darters as they move their way up the lower rouge and they're also in the middle rouge. So they're fairly small fish that can be about 10 inches long. They have these rounded fins, including run right on the belly and it's rounded. Um, unlike these mottled sculpins that have these longer, thinner fin uh, fins and smaller eyes. Um, and then also this other invasive crayfish that we have, this red swamp crayfish. Uh, actually, one of our team leaders discovered this in a pond in Novi and reported it to the DNR. And since then, uh, they have trapped uh, tens of thousands of crayfish out of that same pond. So very aggressive, tend to be in detention ponds, not in the river but they dig these gigantic bur burrows and they can outcompete the native crayfish. 
So when you're out there, look at the crayfish. If you see something that's got a really bright red body with these bright red raised spots, it could be that. More than likely, it's just going to be your native crayfish. Um, and we'll try to show some of this when you're out in the field. Next up is a, a section we're going to go through with um, with doing so identifying some illicit discharges. But I just want to point out on the slide here is um, what you're looking at is um, a river. Of course, we're post St. Patty's Day at this point, but uh, this will be an activity that will go on in Ch the Chicago River. That um, actually tracing dye is used to to turn the Chicago River uh, green there during St. Patty's Day. Um, but anyway, for this particular situation, as you can see here in the picture, it's pretty, uh, the color there is pretty, uh, pretty stunning. And what happened here is this was a situation, um, some uh, non-toxic tracing dye to, to look for um, plumbing fixtures or illicit connections um, ended up going into the river through via, via storm rain. And um, you can see how, how, um, how it stands out, um, but again, um, if you, you were to see that and not know what it is, you'd be you'd be calling and going something's going on with the river that we need to um, to address. Um, anyway, that's where um, your key as as volunteer team leaders and and uh, folks that are involved in Friends of the Rouge are so key here. Um, we need eyes and ears out there to um, to be looking for um, various things. You're, you're visiting as a team leader. You're going out to sites that sometimes people don't visit on a regular basis. Um, so you add those extra eyes and ears out there to, um, to identify uh, and, and report things that you might see. And some, um, some, some things have been reported uh, by Friends of the Rouge um, volunteers over the years, so, so it's very key. Uh, some, some oil, oil spills that have happened were reported, uh, failing septic systems. Um, so it's, it's, it's great having those extra sets um, of eyes and ears and you're so important as, as team leaders. And also um, out in just your daily lives, if you're, you're noticing things, if you're walking along the river, you know, along a path or something, you see something that isn't, isn't, um, isn't what it should be the, the, to, to get that reported. Um, as we talked about a lot in this uh, presentation earlier about the development of the Rouge River watershed and just how how critical that uh, the human um, the human impact on the the, wa um, the watershed has has affected water quality. Well, that's um, that's due to as we've developed, uh, we have a system of of drains um, that you've probably seen out in the front of your, your home is uh, the, the catch basins um, that are the direct connect um, to through a set series of pipes that are going out directly to our streams and rivers untreated. So um, you can see that if there are pollutants that do end up on, um, on that roadway or into that storm drain, um, that that's gonna have um, a, a big effect uh, on the river. It's not going to the, the, the uh, sewage treatment plant to get treated before it gets released out into um, the waterways. Um, so as the fish says in here, you know, the soap is for, for, for uh, dishes and not for fishes. You know, we need as, as human um, and human um, inhabitants of the watershed is to be cognizant of the activities that we do to try to prevent, you know, pollution from, from, reaching, from reaching our waterways because of the, um, the storm drains and how our um, how drainage system is set up. Um, next slide, please. So um, part of the, this next uh, series of slides in the, in the presentation is just to point out some some um, some types of illicit discharges and what they look like. Um, not to make you an expert in that, but just if you realize that um, uh, something doesn't look right, it's it's best to report it and then have somebody take a peek at it just to make sure that there isn't um, an acute or chronic oops, um, pollution source going on that's that's causing problems. And so here's a few of these. Um, one of those is just on the top top left there is um, what's called a, a, a failing septic system. And you can see in that picture that there are um, some gray water and, and gray water is going to be an indication that there's a, there's a sewage source. And so what happens with septic systems, for those of you um, that are not familiar with them, is that there are still areas of the watershed that aren't connected um, to, to um, a sewage treatment system where it would end up, uh, the wastewater would end up flowing to, to uh, a wastewater treatment plant for treatment. 
um, that there's actually an on-site system that's handling that through a drainage field and also a tank that's collecting um, the solids in the um, from the home. And so if those systems are not maintained properly, there, there is, um, there is um, an issue where they could where they could back up or overflow like you're seeing here um, in the net wastewater that's that's going to be a direct um, threat to public health and, and also also water quality there um, on the bottom left uh, we see uh, um, the picture there with it's got some gray water so that's going to be um, your typical um, sewage sewage um, discharge indication there and you might be smelling some of the sharp sharp tangy odor with that and also the water would be be appearing to be turbid um, on the upper upper right um what we have here is, is soil erosion as earlier in the presentation we talked about sedimentation being a um a, a water quality concern and what happens with too much sediment the rivers are designed to to handle sediment but in this particular case um, if it's too much sediment, then the, the, the sediment settles out in the bottom of the stream. It does smother habitats and also will plug up uh, fish, fish gills. Of course, that affects um, also our um, aquatic insects that uh, do breathe um, oxygen out of the water. Um, so if, if you're seeing uh, excessive uh, soil erosion, like in this particular picture, it looks like a construction site that doesn't have those adequate um, measures to uh, prevent soil for for uh, leaving the site so those would be things that, that you would uh, be looking to uh, report um, also on the bottom of that page is just some um, some algae growth that just uh, people are showing a little bit too too much love to the lawn there with some um, some fertilizer um, fortunately in Michigan there is a um, the ban on phosphorus in the fertilizer um, but you know, it is a situation you may see if you're seeing excessive algae growth that there's a lot of nutrients going in there and that's maybe causing some fish kills, um, um, taking the oxygen out of the water. This next series of slides shows some other uh, examples of some pollution in the, the, the one on the upper left here is kind of the classic um, petroleum sheen. So you're going to be seeing that rainbow sheen. Um, if there is petroleum, uh, fuel, diesel, or um, gasoline that is that is uh, in the in the waterway, so that would be an indication um, that that that's that's happened at the site. And there is, like I said earlier, there is um, there is cases where Friends of the Ridge volunteers actually identified an active um, an active um, discharge going on from a from a petroleum spill, and uh, we're able to report that and get it taken taken care of. Also, some of the things that do impact our waterways, here's an example on the bottom uh, left here is uh, we talked about the sewage systems and even just with on-site, is that we have a lot of, um, a lot of sewer systems throughout the area. Um, and if those do get um, overloaded, um, there is a, there's a possibility that they could surcharge and, and, and this happened um, during, during the, the heavy rainstorms that we received last year where the, the flows were we're going <clears throat> so much into the system that they actually the manhole covers blew off and, and um, sewage just just all over everywhere. But um, I think I reported some... one of those to you. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that was yes, nasty. Yeah, Sal Sally was uh, key in reporting of some of the ones that were going along on the uh, the Middle Rouge, where the interceptor um, runs along um, a Heinz Drive. And uh, what the system here is what you're seeing in that picture is what some of the examples of if that if that overflow happens and it'll leave the you know the material the gray the gray matter and then also just some sanitary debris in there too. So it's a pretty distinctive uh, discharge uh, uh, residue that's left. Um, also, uh, listed connections, which are which are pipes that are are meant to um, are designed to go to a sanitary sewer that are going out into directly into our streams and rivers is um, this is also a, a pollution source. Back um, back in um, the plumbing code used to allow floor drains and, and um, to discharge directly out into like a storm sewer or even directly out into a stream or river. Um, it sets, it's since changed. Um, so every fixture within a building should be going to a sanitary sewer. But 
Um, one of the things Wayne County does uh, is use die test of uh, buildings for illicit connections. Um, and throughout throughout our history, we found um, a lot of places that had a lot of their fixtures, or at least part of the building, or maybe all of the building that was not connected properly to the sanitary sewer. Um, so those are things that just happen. It's not necessarily on purpose, <laughs> and it's just part of how um, um, if inspections aren't done to, to, to make sure that the connections are done properly. And there's, there's a lot of different ways why, why this happens, but it's something that, that is out there. And, and like that dye, the green dot, the green dye picture that you saw earlier, that was something that um, um, the plumbers were trying to confirm is, is where the f um, um, fixtures in a particular building were going and, and the dye escaped and ended up into, into the river. Um, but you can see there that's that is a that is a big pollution source. You can just if if every day that uh, discharge is, is going out into the river. Um, on the bottom right, um, you have uh, some fish kills, and uh, it could be a situation um, where with a, a lot of dead fish, it could be a, um, an acute um, discharge that's going on there that affects um, the fish that causes the kill, or it could be especially in the spring after it's been a hard winter and there's a lot of ice. Um, there may be a lot of fish that have been under the ice that, that, um, that died during the winter and then you're seeing a lot of them together. But if it's something that certainly doesn't look like it's by a natural course, it's, it's certainly something um, to report. Um, next slide, please. Um, just a few more um, examples is just uh, runoff from industrial sites as we talked about in um, the earlier slides with the development on um, it. Housekeeping at, at sites and even at your own home is, is really critical on, on keeping pollution sources out of our out of our streams and rivers. So as you can see, like in the pictures, if there's sloppy housekeeping that allows hazardous materials to hit the ground, you know, any rain or snow melt is going to take those directly over, over into um, a catch basin. So again, we mentioned uh, already uh, misconnected floor drains and illicit discharges um, from, from buildings. Um, and residences are also also keys there, um, and just spills spills that are happening on the roadway, um, like was what was reported um, to friends of the Rouge you know, uh, with uh, with from a bug hunt team. It's just those things happen, um, you know, with accidents and um, and some people do intentionally dump down dump down storm drains. Um, next next uh, slide, please. Um, next slide here is just kind of what to report. We threw a lot of pictures at you to um, to get um, an idea of what um, illicit um, what illicit discharges look like and in, in what to report. If you have any questions about what that is or what they are, don't hesitate to reach out to Friends of the Rouge if you're not sure. Um, but but um, this is just a summary of the things to report. Basically, if it looks if it looks weird, you know unusual or something that shouldn't be there, it's it's worth having somebody follow up on. Um, don't approach anybody. If you see somebody that's directly dumping, don't approach the person or persons, um, you know, get as much information as you can and, you know, back away and, you know, call call 911 and let the professionals deal with somebody, you know, dumping. That's, uh, you don't want to put yourself in, a, you know, in an unsafe situation. Um, um, next slide, please. And with that, who do we call if you if you see things? Um, well, if, if there's any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to 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 friends of the Rouge in terms of um, trying to pick those things out. And I do believe that there is some um, information available, or there's an IDEP tip card that actually does have these these pictures, so that if you even want to put it on your phone or, or have it with you in, in your car, that that you have it there. Um, but basically, Eagle does a um, a 24 hour hotline there, which is on the top there, the P's line. Um, as well as the three counties, depending on which county that you're in when, um, when you're seeing the, the incident and want to report something. Um, all, all the counties there do have um, people who, who will respond or investigate uh, pollution complaints as well as, as the state. Um, one of the things that um, I do for Wayne County um, is to also be following up on, on complaints um, or illicit discharges that are reported in Wayne County. So.